ಗತ್ವಾರಹೇತುಸ್ತಾಲಂಬನಮನಂತರಂ ತಥೈವಾಧಿಪತೆಯಂ ಸ ಪ್ರತ್ಯೂನಾಸ್ತಿ ಪಂಚಮ ಚಾತ್ವರ ಪ್ರತ್ಯಯೇತೂರ್ ಆರಂಭನಮನಂತರ ತಥೈವಾಧಿಪತೆಯಂ ಚ MMK chapter 1 verse 3 There are four cornerstones of causation the root cause the objective support the gapless and very similar to that this there is this the overarching command So the first two verses of MMK, for me, after two or three years of studying them, could not be clearer and their translation couldn't be simpler. They, tra they translate themselves. They're Nagarjuna just stating the basic truth of emptiness, that uh, all, thi all things, everything is empty and there is not anything. What we think of as things are in fact empty. Of self-existence. But now we've got the third verse and the first difficulty is I don't know whether it's Nagarjuna himself speaking or the opponent. Uh, if it's the opponent it's on the basis that there are such things as self-existing causes hence able to be numbered as four. Uh, and if it's Nagarjuna He, he's he's saying something about action something which is very difficult to understand so as an expedient means as a, as a skillful means he's talking about four kinds of causes as a, a convenient fiction so uh, we've got to consider both those possibilities and it may be that Nagarjun intended us it, it, it may be that he intended for us not to fall into the sin of certainty uh, as Asfagorsia did very often in his epic poetry you often sense that he was presenting you with a conundrum to which there was no right answer and, uh, and uh, these, these, these teachers, these poets by such means prevent us from falling into the trap of thinking we know and uh, If you're thinking about politics, you know, the, the middle is, is to some extent the, the place of not knowing what the right thing is, but knowing that left, the, the views of the left and the views of the right, especially the views of the left who are so self-righteous in their com supposed compassion, they're wrong. You know, the, the people, I see so many Buddhists because they know that the Buddhist teaching comes out of compassion so they they think that the compassionate left is right but no the compassionate left is adhering to a false view compassion without wisdom is very dangerous and that's what you've got on the left uh, the right tend to be less ideological and more reacting against what they rightly see is the the stupidity of the left uh, but the right are also obviously wrong in terms of not being in the middle uh, so on some level the difficulty of this verse has to do with that it's sort of it has to do with being in balance you know Master Dogen used the uh, the metaphor of a steel yard if 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 you if you get a steel yard in balance and then nail it nail it so it won't move that is not balanced that's fixed so master Dogen said if you want to study balance study a steel yard because when it's in balance it doesn't really it's not fixed in place it could go either way and uh, so a verse like this which kind of keeps us on our toes we don't really know which way which way it's going. It has to do with that, I think. 
because certainly after s studying it for two or three years and going this way and that, in the end, I don't know which, which one it is. Is it Nagarjuna speaking or is it the opponent uh, saying what he thinks about four kinds of cause on the basis of self-existence of causes? So let's go into it and consider those two possibilities. Chatvaraha pratyaya is a nominative plural phrase. So chatvaraha is nominative plural for, and pratyaya, pratyayaha, before the hetul, the, the last uh, uh, anusvara, was it visaga? I never know which. The H with a dot underneath at the end is dropped, so it becomes pratyaya. Chatvaraha pratyaya. So that means four causes. Uh, and if it's a nominative phrase like that, you can translate it there are. So there are four causes. Uh, but I've used a bit of poetic license here. Because the speaker says there are four, not five. Uh, and also a pratyaya has a, a meaning of the grounds of causation, the causal grounds. And if you talk about a four, causal grounds. Uh, the, the translation that sprang to my mind was four cornerstones and that's related, I'll talk about it a bit later, uh, in my professional work helping children with dyslexia, dyspraxia, I would often dis describe to children's mums that uh, the four vestibular reflexes which are implicated in dyslexia and dyspraxia, they're like the four cornerstones of, of living. Uh, they're much more fundamental than people realise. So when you've got a problem like dyslexia, difficulty reading, difficulty with language, and difficulty, uh, yeah, difficulty reading, difficulty with eye movement, especially in dyslexia, difficulty with balance, and dyspraxia again, difficulty with balance and coordination. Especially dyslexia tends people, educationalists tend to think of it as a cognitive issue, but actually it's a balance issue. It's to do with eye movements. It's to do with uh, balance, it's to do with the vestibular system, it's to do with, in particular with four vestibular reflexes. And uh, the grandfather of neurophysiology, the, the first guy to really talk about reflexes and study them in the laboratory, was Charles Sherrington, Sir Charles Sherrington, who incidentally was quite a big supporter of uh, FM Alexander, although they didn't get on personally. Sherrington recognised the truth of Alexander's work because Alexander looked at the human organism as a whole and Sherrington thought that was important. So in 1906 Charles Sherrington wrote a book called The Integrative Action of the Nervous System. The Integrative Action of the Nervous System. So the clue is in the title there. Sherrington could see that the nervous system worked as a whole. The human organism worked as a whole. So he, when he talked about the simple reflex, he used a memorable phrase, the convenient fiction of the simple reflex. So that is very much consistent with the, the, uh, the conventional truth and the ultimate truth in the Buddhist teaching. The conventional truth is we use convenient fictions, like in law, I exist. Might cross, I'm responsible, if I break the speed limit, I get three points on my licence. So, if I go to the court and say, please, my lord, I, I, I'm empty of my own self-existence, it's not going to work as a way of appealing me three points on the licence. You know, our human life in the world depends on convenient fictions like personal responsibility or individual existence. Uh, so when we speak of reflexes, they are, in Sherrington's words, convenient fictions, but they're very convenient. So uh, again, 1982, I went to Japan, met Gudo Nishijima, and it, it was impressed on me that the Buddhist teaching is a philosophy of action. It's all about action. And so I think, it, as we'll shortly see in the next verse, this chapter, what Nagarjuna is really interested in, is the causes of action. So 
you know, in my journey to get to the bottom of, of how to act right, how to point oneself in the right direction in the business of acting, uh, I came to the, to the Alexander Technique and uh, my Alexander head of training was Ray Evans was a kind of a bit of an expert on these vestibular reflexes. So I followed in Ray's footsteps and went to train at the Institute of Neurophysiological Psychology in Chester, uh, where Peter Blythe uh, had done a lot of pioneering research uh, on a very independent basis onto the problem, into the problem of uh, immature primitive reflexes, especially immature vestibular reflexes. Uh, he was stimulated by trying to understand why some children had had difficulty, even though they were bright, they had difficulty in reading, in other words, dyslexia. So that's a long story, but that's the background to when I see Nagarjuna sp speaking of four causes, not five, but four, and in the next verse, they have to do with action. Uh, to me, whether he, whether he intended it consciously or not, he, he was pointing somehow to this truth of there being four vestibular reflexes, which are so fundamental in, in human development and human behaviour. So I translated Chatvaraha Pratyaya. There are four cornerstones of causation. Hetu. Hetu means the primary cause or the root cause. Uh, in the phrase Hetu Pratyaya, that means direct and indirect causes or primary and secondary causes or root cause, root cause and conditions. So Hetu is the root cause or the primary cause. So the first line says Chatvaraha Pratyaya Hetu there are four cornerstones of causation, the root cause. Then the second, the second para says, Arambanam manantaram. So the verbal root, ram or lam. So in some versions of the text, it has the classical version, which is alambanam with an L. But the original text, as far as I can understand, uh, had the hybrid Sanskrit version, which is a R, Arambanam. So this is interesting because it, it, it shows that uh, Nagarjuna was sort of uh, steeped in whatever the Buddha's teaching was recorded in before it, the records evolved into classical Sanskrit. And that was called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit. So in, in the Buddhist hybrid scan Sanskrit rendering, Arambanam. And I think that's the rendering that Nagarjuna used, but uh, later scribes sort of tidied it up into classical Sanskrit. And the academic Anne MacDonald has, has argued that by doing that, the later scribes often messed up the meter. Uh, so so they, uh, they were wrong to intervene and try to turn what was originally probably hybrid Sanskrit into classical Sanskrit. Anyway, that's why if you listen to Professor Kachinath Nyaupane, the version he's following, it says, uh, pratyaya he dush alambana manantaram. But what I'm, the text I'm following, Shaungye's text mainly, Chatvaraha pratyaya he dur arambana manantaram. So, the, the verbal root ram means to hang down. So to me that dangling down suggests something about gravity. Uh, but in the dictionary, aram, ar, uh, arambanam is given as something like the objective support. So it's, it's, uh, it means support, or sometimes it's just equivalent to vishaya, which means the sense object. So the hetu, the root cause, arambanam, is the objective support. If, if, we, uh, if, we, if we relate it to what's going on here and now, 
you could say that the root cause of the action I'm doing now, you could say the root cause is meeting my teacher in 1982. You know, he, he motivated, he had to have his motivation as well. So, or impulse. So the impulse to do this job, the motivation, goes back to Gudo Nishijima and his master, who I uh, prostrated myself to in 1986, Master Renpo Niwa. We spent a whole afternoon waiting for Master Niwa to arrive from Eheji. Uh, he was visiting the temple in Shizuoka. And it was after one retreat, Nishijima Sensei and I spent about three hours just standing around outside the uh, outside the temple, Bulkeyin, uh, just to go in and prostrate ourselves to Master Niwa. And then when we'd done that, we went, we went home. So it was a kind of a, a little win window into the into the feudalistic world of, of master and disciple, uh, a tradition which I hadn't done a very good job of following. It must be admitted. So uh, you can say that the impulse, the motivation, comes from Nishijima Sensei, from Master Renpo Niwa, and uh, also Nishijima Sensei's teacher was Master Kordo Soaki. So uh, this this job we're doing now is very much related to practicing zazen. You know, I practice zazen this morning. I'm sitting in in the lotus now. So that's to do with the root cause of this effort, and then the objective support is uh, gravity is always there. You know, my my ability to sp to speak as I'm doing is related with my how upright I'm sitting. It, if I if I do the if I sit in a sort of the mind being being mindful in the wrong kind of way and you know, I'm slumping half asleep, that's not good for my voice. And if I if I stiffen up like I'm on the, the military parade ground, that also doesn't make for a resonant sort of sound. So uh, if I'm harmonising with gravity better, letting letting. Uh, Letting evolution do the work, if you like, as I was taught to sit in the Alexander work, you know, not uh, not doing it, rather letting it do itself, thinking up without without trying to do it, then that will be good for the voice. And in fact, F.M. Alexander, the starting point of his investigations was he was losing his voice. Uh, so... Aram banam means the objective support. You, you could include breakfast. Uh, you could include the. I'm using a MacBook Air, so everybody, all the software that went into that is, is supporting the effort. Uh, not to mention the hardware. Somebody working hard in China, no doubt, uh, has produced the components of, of the uh, of the computer. Uh, you talk about objective support. It's hard to not think about money. So uh, I, I earned a lot of money when I was in Japan uh, in my twenties and early th late twenties and early thirties. I started a family. I had a period of being very eager to earn earn money. I worked for an economist in Japan, uh, doing copy editing and then later translation work. So uh, he was a big supporter of me. The Shobo Genzo translation was, was supported by the Japan Foundation. So without all that kind of support, this effort wouldn't be taking place. Okay, and then the last word in, in the second para, anantaram. So an means not, and anta means end, uh, antara means gap. So anantaram means without a gap, the gapless. Now, what does that mean? On the face of it, it means the immediate, what's immediate. So, like, here and now, there's no gap between what I described as the root cause, the motivation, and the objective support, which is the computer. There's no gap there. This relates to what Nishijima is sort of 
subject object action in his soul system. So conventionally there's truth in that. Ultimately it's not true because ultimately there's no subject separate from an object. There's no there's never any gap in the first place is the ultimate truth. But if we're talking in terms of convenient fictions, you can say as a convenient fiction, there's the root cause I was describing before, and then there's the computer. And so then the the immediate, the gapless, is contact between subject and object. Uh, it's, you see, again, I feel uncomfortable saying it, because yesterday I was saying that's all a load of rubbish. So it's, it has to do with this, there's the conventional truth and the ultimate truth. Conventionally speaking, it's sometimes useful to talk about subject, object, and action being the place where subjects and object meet. So there's no gap between subject and an object. So in that sense, anantaram means gapless, no gap between subject and object. But there's another meaning. When you talk about gapless, so in Asfagorsa's epic poetry, he describes the, the Buddha's fingers, or it may be a, an apsara's, an, a, an angel's fingers, as being without gaps. So if you've done a lot of karate and battered your hands into a punching board, or you've been a wicket keeper, you know, you've, you've probably got various gaps in your fingers because you, they're not, then you know, they cease to be perfectly aligned. So, uh, gapless fingers, you know, su suggest beautiful hands. But that the word for that is anantara, gapless. So that that's the original meaning of it. Now, but when I, in this context, what anantara suggests to me is inhibition of a, ref a vestibular reflex called the asymmetric tonic neck reflex. And what this does in children who've got dyslexia is it separates the body and the brain and the eyes and the ears. It separates them into two sides. Because when the reflex is immature, like in a newborn baby, when the baby turns its head to one side, it'll tend to go in like a, a fencer's position or a goalkeeper's position with its arms and legs tending to do that. So, in other words, if the head turns to the left, everything wants to extend to the left. And the left hand want, and arm want to extend, the right hand and arm want to flex, and vice versa. So, that affects the eyes as well. So that when the reflex is immature, the, if you ask a, a child who's got this reflex immature to track, it'll tend to jump across the middle line. If you watch its eyes closely, if you want, its eyes want to go to the right or to the left. So the eyes will jump across the middle line. And that's why a child has dyslexia, because it can't track from side to side. Similarly, a child with that, who's got that reflex immature, they'll struggle with their handwriting, because if I'm holding the pen in my right hand and I look down at my paper to write, my arm will want to do that. My arms will want to do that. So then the child will struggle to, against the reflex. So it's, it's, that reflex causes one to be split into two sides. It's like taking sides against oneself physically. You know, I described that happening psychologically. Uh, you know, if, if your mother encourages you to take sides against your father, you're taking sides against yourself. Kind of psychologically, but he is taking sides against himself physically. So this is a real obstacle to free action. That's why I ended up studying it. You know, in the journey I've described, trying to get the bottom of right action or action in the right direction. If this reflex is immature, it will really stop you going. It'll stop you using yourself well in Alexander terms. So your child who's got this reflex immature. If you ask them to march up and down, they'll go into a homolateral pattern. So they'll set off with the right arm and the right leg together, then the left arm and left leg together. Or if you imagine them taking a penalty in, in, in the school playground, they'll tend to, instead of having a sort of cross pattern, you. so if you, if you watch a rugby player hitting a conversion or a penalty, when they, when they follow through with their kick, their, their leg and their arm will be really crossing over the midline. If this reflex is immature, 
the child can't cross the midline. So it'll it'll take it up taking a penalty, it'll look very, very badly coordinated, possibly attracting bullying in the playground and what have you. So in some children, like say for example in my case I used to play rugby, uh, I was never particularly well coordinated at but I was quite athletic and, uh, and aggressive, so I could, I could. I was okay at running. You know, I wasn't the fastest runner in the team, but I was okay. I could, even though I had the reflex, in somewhat poorly developed form, poorly integrated form, I could overcome it. But it, I still wasn't using myself as well as I, as I might have been, had the reflex been better integrated. And most of us are like that. In very few of us. Is that reflex perfectly well coordinated? So, in some sense, there's a little bit of a gap there. There's a, there's a gap, you know, in the two sides of the body. So, if you go for a nice long walk and we're walking in a cross pattern movement, that will help that integrate. We'll feel more integrated at the end of the walk if you're walking well uh, and not in a big hurry. So, that's, an, that's another aspect that I suspect that Nagarjuna might be pointing to with the word anandaram. As, as the third of these four cornerstones of causation. Chatvaraha pratyaya hetur manantaram. There are four cornerstones of causation. The root cause, the objective support, the gapless. Okay, well, I described anantaram in terms of the vestibular reflex. I'll go back and dis describe hetur and arambanam, what vestibular reflexes they might correspond to. So hetur, the root cause, the primary cause, might relate to the most primitive fear reflex. So if you want to frighten a newborn baby, if you, if you just drop it, the midwife takes the baby and just drops it, a few inches, the baby will go, <laughs> it'll, its arms will fly out and it'll gasp, and then the arms will come back in again, <sighs> and you might cry, you might, you might cry out. So that's, that reflex was identified first by an Austrian paediatrician named Ernst Morrow, so it's called the Morrow reflex. And uh, it has, it's really motivational, that's the point, you know, to, that's why hetur fits. It's it's a root. It's it's the root of, of all of these vestibular problems, like dyslexia, dyspraxia. So it, it, because it's developmentally, it's very early. It's a, it's a real root reflex. It's a, see before it, there's a fear paralysis response, which it, which is like an amoeba. You know, if you, if you give a stimulus to an amoeba, it sh kind of shrinks. The fear paralysis response is like that. It's so primitive. It's not even called a reflex. Uh, it's, so the, the fear paralysis will be a kind of white fear. If you go into shock and, and you, you kind of shrink back, that's, that's the fear paralysis response. Because the moral reflex is thought to be the first true reflex, so that if it's stimulated like about six weeks after conception, it goes with the fear par paralysis response, only more vigorously, <gasps> shrinking back. But, but vigorously, and then and then the second part of the moral breaks the first part, and and there's a contraction forward. So it's it's an inconvenient thing to have uh, in the classroom. So so you get that with a child who, who's prone to labile emotions. Uh, going red as I did very much she had a problem going red when I was young yeah. uh, over overreacting hypersensitivity because the morrow gets the eyes ready for long distance and gets you gets you for fight or flight so adrenaline being pumped up and so on so it's the child who's exhausted when he comes home from school has got an immature moral reflex uh, could say much more about it but you know you can you can you can look it up you can Google it if you're interested. So, the second vestibular reflex, developmentally, is quite closely related to the moral reflex, but it's also very much related to gravity. It's, it's the baby's first way of responding to Mother Earth. 
and so it, Peter Blythe would call it the baby balance reflex in explaining it to mums. But if you're talking to doctors or scientists, it's the tonic labyrinthine reflex. So the moral reflex is the most tonic of all because the whole body goes into extensor tone or, or flexor tone. The tonic labyrinthine Lab, tonic lab, labyrinthine reflex similarly the the baby when it comes out of the womb it's tonic showing tonic labyrinthine reflex in extension the neck extends the head extends the whole back extends and when the baby's in the womb it's showing tonic labyrinthine reflex in flexion when the fetus is in a flexus habitus mode in the womb so that reflex provides two there's a dichotomy of ways of re responding to Mother Earth or responding to gravity when you're out of the womb. If the baby's head goes back, it'll tend to go into like a crucifix position. And if the baby's head goes forward, it, it'll tend to go into a... Uh, like that. So this, this is to do with gravity. So hence I see a connection with arambanam, lamb, means hanging down, dangling down. And uh, when you understand these four vestibular reflexes, as Ray, st Ray, Ray used to describe what uh, Ray Evans, my Alexander Hill trained, said that what FM Ale uh, the pattern FM Alexander observed was essentially morotonic labyrinthine reflex, moro TLR. So this pulling the head back and down that people do, uh, or, or, or slumping. He, he is related to the tonic labyrinthine reflex because it, it makes the head either want to go back or down. So back and down or forward and down. And so the antidote to that in Alexander terms is to let the head go forward and up. So if the tonic, if the tonic labyrinthine reflex is in control and the head goes forward, the movement is forward and down. And often in trying to counter that, like in bad Zazen instruction, you pull the head back like that, but that's back and down. What we want is forward and up. So the, the Alexander direction is not something you can do. It's, a, it's to prevent the, 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 uh, the habitual response that's rooted in the Moro reflex and the tonic labyrinthine reflex. So, Hetur means the root cause, <clears throat> the motivational, and I'm suggesting it's related as a cause of action. It's related with the moral reflex and the inhibition thereof. So if you're going to sit in Zazen for half an hour, the first thing you want to do is not stimulate the moral reflex. Don't be in a panic, don't be in a rush to get your dirty paws on something. Say another... The, when Ernst Morrow dis, discovered the Morrow reflex or identified it, he described it in German, I think something like Klammertung reflex. It means, in English, it means a grasping reflex. So the Morrow is the hands do that, then they do that. So it's, a, it's interesting, isn't it? It's a, a grasping reflex. It's an end gaining reflex in Alexander terms. So the first thing is if, if you don't want to stimulate the Morrow reflex, don't try to be Buddha. That's what Dogen says at the beginning of his instruction for Zazen. Don't, don't be grasping at getting something. So again, the teaching of empty has helped us in that direction because we realise there is no thing. Buddha is not a thing to be grasped. It's, it's more about uh, waking up to a right direction, a true direction. See, there's so much condensed in it. This verse could contain so much, uh, hence the difficulty of it. So, hetur means the root cause related to the moral reflex. In Alexander terms, it's related to the direction to let the neck be free. You know, stop striving and stiffening your neck. Arambanam means the objective support seems to me to relate to the tonic labyrinthine reflex which is related to gravity in alexander terms the direction let the head go forward and up 
is the cause of the kind of action that we want. Then anandaram means the gapless. Uh, it suggests immediacy, inaction, no gap between subject and object, but it also suggests no gap between the two sides of ourself. And in reflex terms, the inhibition of the asymmetric tonic neck reflex, especially by cross pattern movements, is what results in that gapless condition. On to the second line. Tataiva di pateam cha. That's the third para. So tata means like that. So. And eva is emphatic. So tataiva means exactly so. Or very similarly. Very similar to that. Adipati. Sorry, adipata. Adipata is uh, ta is means ness, the, the state of. And adipa means so pa means protect or guard. And adipa means uh, the protector, the guardian, or, or the commander, and or the ruler, the sovereign. So adipata means predominance uh, or the state of being in command and then interestingly he adds he adds so adipata is nominative singular feminine and Nagarjuna adds the word yam which means this nominative singular feminine this so adipateyam means this this predominance Tataiva in in a very similar way, very similar to that. This predominance. Okay, so let me just talk about uh, uh, if I go back to Nyanatiloka Nyanantiloka's. Uh, Buddhist dictionary uh, who explained all the, the Pali terms in, in, in detail uh, how he described Pratyaya uh, okay in the last book of the Abhidharma Pitaka in Pali according to the Nyanantiloka's Buddhist dictionary 24 Pachaya are listed so Pachaya is the Pali equivalent of Pratyaya a pachaya or condition equals a Sanskrit prataya is something on which something else, the so-called conditioned thing, is dependent. The first four in the list of 24 are given as number one, hetu pachaya, root condition, number two, aramana pachaya, the object condition, number three, adipati pachaya, predominance condition, Number four, Anantara Pachaya, proximity condition. And number five is Samanantara, Samanantara Pachaya, contiguity condition. Okay, so you can see that there was, there was a tradition before Nagarjuna wrote this verse, going back to the, the Pali Abhidharma, to describe 24 Pratyaya. So the first thing this verse is, is saying is, no, there's not 24, there's only four. And uh, the order is different. But here in, the, in this list of parts, number four, four and five are Anantara and Samanantara. So they're practically the same. So the proximity condition, the continu contiguity condition in Sanskrit, the gapless, Anantaram, the gapless. Uh, but number three, which in this list is number four, adipati, the predominance condition. So the 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 way that's explained is if you go back to the, what I, the action I'm doing now, it's like when I just get on and do it, 
what what is the overarching cause uh, of me doing it? Well, what is what is my motive? What is what is the real cause of me doing it? You can say that the root cause is the efforts of Nishijima Sensei and the, and the Buddhist patriarchs in his line going all the way back to Gautama Buddha. But what am I? What am I actually? What's actually motivating me now? You know what? What am I actually doing? Uh, and uh, this is I'm actually I'm actually saying my conclusion. You know, if if somebody asked me about uh, if somebody asked me thirty years ago, or twenty years, or or ten years ago, I would always be speaking somebody else's truth, whether it was. When I just met Nishijima Sensei and was doing Shobogenzo, if I was talking about Shobogenzo, I hadn't made it my own. I hadn't really made it my own. I, I was doing his, his, I was serving him. Although I was practicing Zazen very diligently, trying to make it my own, it wasn't really my own. And then the same was true of the Alexander work, and the same was true of the reflex work. That's why I wanted to stop doing it. But this, this is me speaking. The, I don't have what Nagarjuna's saying. I just it's it's there isn't any gap between uh, what Nagarjuna's saying and what I want to say from my, as my own conclusion. So I really feel like this is I'm motivated to tell the truth uh, as as I found it to be, and. Uh, the fact that I haven't actually got any audience is fine because, thanks to YouTube, I can just put it up there. And uh, yeah, if it, I'm speaking to an audience of zero, but that's okay. I'd rather be doing that than than, uh, than having a large audience and and be saying to saying to people stuff that I didn't really hadn't really made my own. You know, so. The overarching situation is, is like that. So, and again, I want to explain it in terms of Alexander work and in terms of the reflex, because very similarly to the there being no gap between the two sides of you, if you've inhibited the asymmetric tonic neck reflex, the left and the right sides of you are well integrated. Okay, there's no gap, and the fourth. The, the four vestibular reflexes, so that they're in developmental hierarchy, and this one is it's not a true primitive reflex because it doesn't emerge till about six months when the baby gets up off the floor for the first time. And the way the baby does that is it's lying on its tummy, and its neck extends, and then its arms extend so that pushes him up, and the hips and knees bend so the baby goes into the cat sit position. So neck and arms extended, hips and knees flexed. So that's the symmetrical tonic neck reflex, it's called, or the cat sit position, the cat sit reflex. And when it's immature, it makes it very difficult to, to stand upright or to sit upright, because uh, it, especially when you're standing upright, your neck is extended. When your neck's extended, your hips and knees want to flex if that reflex is immature, so it makes your bottom stick out. So. Uh, it results in what's sometimes called a simian walk, an ape-like walk, because monkeys generally, when they're walking, they show this reflex. Their neck extends, and then their their hips flex, so their bottom sticks out, and their knees bend. So that if you want to imitate a monkey walking, you, you, you'll feel the symmetrical tonic neck reflex. Neck extended, hips and knees flexed. So if if when you're sitting in zazen your neck is extended, so you're not slumped, your neck is extended, then if the, ref the reflex is immature, your arms will, will want to straighten. So by keeping them in the, mu in the cosmic mudra, uh, that's one way of inhibiting the reflex. And uh, also, when the, when the neck's extended, the hip, there'll be tightness, there'll be tension in the hips and knees because the, the signal is coming unconsciously for the hips and knees to flex so to sit well, not to be in the grip of that reflex, you've got the Alexander direction, send the knees forwards and away. 
And that doesn't mean anything to anybody who hasn't experienced what it means in an Alexander lesson, but sending these forwards in a way isn't really to do with the knees, it's to do with the hips and the lower back. It's to do with space in the hip joints. It's to do with releasing, releasing the legs out of the grip of all the unconscious forces that create tension in the lower back and, and in the hips. So the, the point, it relates to this word adipata. So the, the Pali word we have these adipati and it's translated as predominance in the Pali dictionary. But what Nagarjuna uses is adipata. So ta means ness or state. So the state of the adipa means the state of command. So in short, command. But whereas the previous one I'm interpreting as being gapless side to side, this one is very similar because you're looking again at integration, but this time it's integration of top and bottom. And the word adi includes the meaning of over. So I've translated the overarching command. So again, I, you can explain it on so many levels, hence the difficulty of this verse. So the overarching command that's guiding me is clarify this verse to whoever might be listening to it on YouTube. That's the aim of my life, is to make this verse clear to you who's, who's uh, watching it on YouTube. In that sense, that's the cause of my action. It's the ultimate overarching command, the overarching cause of the action I'm doing now. In reflex terms, the fourth cornerstone of causation is inhibition of the symmetrical tonic neck reflex. And, and that gives produces a person who's integrated top and bottom. So not only am I thinking what my overarching point of being, the, the, my raison d'etre is to make this clear. Okay, that's, that's the, the top two inches telling me. The reason you're on this earth is to make Nagarjuna's teaching clear. But that's no good if my voice doesn't respond. And if, if you know, it's only authentic if, I'm sitting in the full lotus and actually talk, not only talking the talk, but walking the walk in terms of Zen sitting practice. So overarching command includes that meaning. So in Alexander terms, sending these forwards and away is, is the important, the all important fourth of the four directions. So second line again, third and fourth pada. Tataiva di pateam cha pratyayo nasti panchamaha. Very similar to that, and very similar to that. So, and is cha, very similar to that, tataiva. And I'm interpreting that the, the fourth one is very similar to that in that they're both to do with integration, having no gap from side to side or top to bottom. So, tataiva, tata plus eva is tataiva. And then adipata plus yam is adipateyam. So, tataiva plus adipateyam is tataiva adipateyam. So, it's another, another level on which this verse is difficult, is you've got so much sandy. In, in that compound of four words. Tatai vadi pateyam. Tata, like that. Eva, emphatic. Adipata, command, predominance. The state of command. The state of the overall guardian, the overseer. Eam, this. Cha, and. And, very similar to that, this, there is this, the overarching command. So, very similar, and, cha, very similar to that, tataiva, there is this, iam, the overarching command, adipata.
tataiva di pate amcha pratyayo nasti panchamaha. So, pratyayo nasti, there is not cause, there is not cornerstone of causation, panchamaha, fifth. Pratyayo nasti panchamaha, there is no fifth cornerstone of cause of causation. So na asti nasti, there is not. Pratyayo, uh, nominative masculine singular pratyaya, which in this verse I've translated cornerstone of causation because there are four of them. Panchamaha fifth. Pratyayo nasti panchamaha. There is no fifth cornerstone of causation. Chatvaraha pratyaya hetu rambanam manantaram tataiva di pateyam cha pratyayo nasti panchamaha. There are four cornerstones of causation. The root cause, the objective support, the gapless, and very similar to that, there is this, the overarching command. There is no fifth cornerstone of causation. <laughs>